what philosophy is in the Christian context, namely the handmaid to theology, an entirely independent standing discipline, but one which in a Christian context is ordered to the same thing that theology is, namely to bring us into greater knowledge of God through knowing the world that he has created. And so philosophy, like theology, uh, orders us to God and uh, helps us to attain happiness. Please help me welcome Dr. Uh, Mirela Oliva. <clears throat> Good evening. Um, thank you, Father Justin, for the uh, warm introduction. Uh, thank you also, Father Peter and Father Anselm and the uh, Dominican School for inviting me uh, to uh, give the Aquinas Lecture. And finally, I would like to thank also the students who have shown me uh, Berkeley around today, uh, Teresa, Jed, and Heidi. It was a great day. Thank you very much. I will uh, talk today about causality in the human life. Uh, does everybody have the handout? All right. Um, <clears throat> So my interest in uh, this um, question um, comes in the context of the um, narrative meaning of life. The narrative meaning of life uh, regards the question, what is the story of my life? How can I uh, recount my life as a story? Uh, what is the narrative shape of my life? And uh, in this talk, I'm trying to show that the uh, core of the narrative of life is causality. Consider your life. Uh, try to understand or uh, describe it. What do you see? It's an overwhelming uh, variety of phenomena. It includes everything about you, uh, events, uh, people, decisions that you have taken, actions, and so on. Now, uh, usually philosophers just list them. And today I'm trying to do more than just listing them. I'm trying to show uh, stronger relations between all these um, features in our lives. So on the objective side are natural events, uh, social and historical events, and relationships with the other persons. All of these, um, sorry, on the, on the subjective side are thoughts, feelings, and actions. All of these are aspects of our life. However, how can we assess their impact on it? How do we account for their role in the whole story of our life? Uh, it is not enough to say that life is just a sum of all uh, these aspects in the way we would say that um, our financial assets are the sum of our uh, bank accounts. When I remember a certain period of my life, I don't just list what I remember, but I recall the things that made my life what it is now. Uh, the impact that intentions, events, and persons have on our life is that, that's much more significant than a simple addition. They reorient our life, give it new forms and directions. For instance, our life is never the same after we have children. When I recount my own life story, I do not just list the events that happened before my daughter was born, for instance, my trip to Capri, and then add to them her birth. Rather, I recount how much my life has changed with her birth. The experience of unconditional love, the change in focus, the uh, sensibility to biological issues never considered before. So because we do not deal with a simple addition, but with a radical transformation, such changes must be considered under the concept of causality. Indeed, changes always take place through a cause. In this talk, I propose three types of causes at work in the human life the causality of intentions, 
the causality of history and events and the uh, causality of persons. Uh, let me start with a little preamble about causality, life, and meaning. These are the concepts that, are, uh, that I am using throughout my talk, and uh, it would be helpful to um, define them before um, going to um, present the three types of causes. The concept of causality has two important functions. First, it helps us to explain changes that happen in our life. By Aquinas' definition, I quote from his commentary on physics, those things are called causes upon which things depend for their existence or their coming to be, end of quotation. All effects thus depend on their causes. To account for a change, we look indeed at the agent, her goals, the form, and the material substratum thereby involved. These are roughly the four types of causes discussed by Aristotle. The efficient cause, the final cause, uh, the goal, the formal cause, uh, and the material cause. As Father Michael Dodds observes in his book, Unlocking Divine Action, yeah, I, is Michael, Father Michael here? Wonderful, I'm, <laughs> I'm very happy you are here today and uh, um, hope uh, I am not uh, straying too much away from uh, the uh, standard Thomistic view on causality. So, <clears throat> so uh, as Father Michael Dodds observes in his book, uh, Unlocking Divine Action, the modern Newtonian scientific model has reduced causality mainly to efficient causality. Thus, the absence of a robust account of causality in the human life might be explained also through this restricted conception of causality. However, Father Dodds shows, in the last decades, science seems to have opened the door to other types of causality. The uh, Newtonian model is now replaced by other models, uh, quantum physics, emergence, and so on. And this could be the right moment for uh, contemporary philosophy to reconsider the diverse types of causality at work in nature and in the human life. Second, causality gives an account of the order of life. The word cause, I quote again from Aquinas, this time uh, from his commentary on the Book of Causes. Uh, so the word cause implies an order of some kind. And in causes, we find an ordering of one to another. End of quotation. The relations cause-effect are relations of dependency. The effect depends on the cause. They thus present to us a picture of our life as being pervaded by intertwined aspects. Every time we try to recount our life, an extended period or a punctual moment of it, we resort to that kind of dependency. Yet we sometimes overlook such an order. This happens, for instance, when uh, we question the overall meaning of our life because we lost purpose, we are crushed by pain or suffer injustice. However, these self-doubts cannot cancel the uh, canvas of our life, which is painted, so to speak, by uh, many causal relations. Uh, to stick to the same metaphor, while they might color our life in dark colors, they nonetheless cannot cancel its operating causes. The uh, causality in our life becomes a problem not only when we have doubts about uh, life's overarching meaning. It is difficult uh, also to pin down causes that shape our life because life is not an object similar to a statue, which uh, Aristotle uh, uses to exemplify how causality works. Uh, clearly, human life is much more complicated than a statue. Um, we cannot point to life uh, in the way we point to um, a statue. It is true that uh, life often appears to be quite a blurred or vague concept. First, unlike the statue that is an um, inanimate object, life consists in self-movement. Namely, it has in itself 
the principle of uh, its own movement identified by Aristotle with the soul. Second, human life has a long span which stretches on earth from birth to death. The existence of a human being is long and complex and it unfolds in time. This historical character makes uh, life's evaluation difficult. How are we supposed to account for something that is never still uh, and whose movement cannot be explained through external causes? Furthermore, our life is always part of the larger life of humanity in its historical development. Our life is not an isolated object, but is integrated in a community with other living beings. Unlike monads, our lives blend with each other. Think, for instance, uh, about the life of a family. The historical and social character of the human life brings up yet another difficulty. Many current accounts of life narrative focus on the personal will and intellect as the locus of causality in one's personal life. This focus is correct in a certain sense, insofar as human life is mainly about personal agency. My life is, well, mine, so it's about me. The will is the efficient cause of our action and our goals represent its final cause. Aristotle's definition of the soul as principle of life seems to back this sort of restriction. When it is about our life, it is primarily about our soul and our body. However, as I will attempt to show, I do not believe that our life should be considered exclusively in terms of a personal agency that can be explained through mental and voluntary causation. As a matter of fact, when we attempt to recount our life story, we include causal relations that are not limited to personal agency, namely to mental and volitional causation. It is helpful in this sense to consider the uh, significations that Aquinas attributes to the term life. All significations are centered around the idea of self-movement. In the proper sense, the first sense, Life is the existence of a being which has the ability to move itself in a certain manner. In this case, life is an essential predicate. For instance, we speak about eternal life, temporal life, animal life, spiritual life. In an improper and broader sense of the word, life is an operation or a sum of operations that occur to an intrinsic principle. And I quote from uh, Summa Theologiae, first part, question 18. By vital operations are meant those whose principles are within the operator, and in virtue of which the operator produces such operations of itself. So you see again the idea of self-movement. In this sense, uh, the unity of understanding, uh, willing, and sensing can be called life. Finally, in an improper and narrower sense, life is the manner of life, the chief direction of the human being. And I quote again from the same uh, question in uh, Summa Theologiae. Thus, as by a similitude, any kind of work in which a man takes delight so that his bent is towards it, his time spent in it, and his whole life ordered with a view to it is said to be the life of that man." End of quotation. In this other sense, we speak about contemplative life, active life, social life, private life, and so on. So if we look at all these significations of the concept of life, um, we can observe that they are centered on the human self uh, in its mode of existence, which is temporal, operational, and developmental. To give an account uh, of human existence, we have thus to consider the embodied stretching of life through time. 
this never occurs in an empty box, but in a material world in which things happen to us, other persons interact with us, and so on. So I think that the three significations of life that um, I uh, uh, quoted from Aquinas do um, permit this sort of inclusion of a larger um, kind of causality um, in the human life. Now, while the concepts of causality and life are classical concepts rooted in ancient Greek philosophy, the concept of meaning is a new modern concept. The significations of meaning are quite diverse. Meaning can mean significance, value, importance, origin, intelligibility, purpose, and guess what? even cause. This multitude of significations is making its way into the growing contemporary scholarship on the meaning of life. This is especially true in Robert Nozick's account of the meaning of life in Philosophical Explanations, which takes causality to be the first among the different kinds of meaning involved in the quest for the meaning of life. Uh, Nozick starts from the observation, which I think is very keen and very um, uh, banal but uh, important, that in our everyday language, meaning often signifies an external causal relationship, pointing either to the cause and then down to the effect, or to the effect up to the cause. For instance, in the statement, this means war, Meaning refers to a causal consequence. Uh, the word this uh, is the cause, uh, signifies the cause for war. In other cases, meaning refers to causal antece antecedents or causal concomitants. Um, for instance, those spots mean measles, or smoke means fire, or red sky at night means fair weather. Regarding the meaning of life, Nozick believes that a life will mean all causal relations that precede a life and make it possible, all causal relations that run through the uh, stretch of time, and all causal relations that mark the significance of life even beyond its time. In this way, the meaning of a life would be, uh, Nozick says, the whole causal nexus and flow of events. I follow in my talk Nozick's um, idea to uh, look at the uh, significance of meaning as uh, cause, and uh, I am trying to show that causality is a fundamental feature of the narrative meaning of life. And as I said, I will um, present three types of causes, uh, causality of um, intentions, causality of history and uh, events, and causality of persons. I will start with causality of intentions. <clears throat> As I mentioned, this type is the most frequent in the contemporary accounts on the narrative meaning of life. Uh, the most elaborate account is offered by Alice Dara McIntyre in After Virtue, and is based on the relation between the unity of life and the unity of virtue. McIntyre starts from the observation that the unity of a virtue in a person's life is intelligible only as a characteristic of a unitary life, a life that can be conceived and evaluated as a whole. A virtuous person must exhibit the same virtue in various situations, not just in one sort of situation or one particular moment. This basic insight into the unity of virtue in relation to the unity of life has been lost in the modern time for several reasons, McIntyre believes. First, modernity divides human life in several segments, each exhibiting its own norms and modes of behavior, uh, work, leisure, childhood, old age, and so on. Second, analytic philosophy tends to break down human action in simple components. The term basic action, for instance, isolates every action from other actions. However, McIntyre argues, particular actions derive their character as parts of larger wholes. A life is thus much, much more 
than a sequence of individual actions and episodes. A third reason for the uh, dismissal of the unity of life is the separation between the individual and the social roles that she plays. For instance, Sartre believes that the self should not be identified with the social roles that it plays. Uh, this distinction makes the Sartrean self unqualified to bear the Aristotelian virtues, which require, in order to be exercised, a network of social relationships. To regain a vision of the unity of life, we should start with an elementary observation. In the course of my life, or the life of my community, lies an immanent structure made of beginning, middle, and end. This is very banal, but there are philosophers also who are actually uh, uh, denying that there is any such ordered structure in the human life. So it's important to stress it out. Uh, it is true that uh, I might often struggle to individuate this structure. I might indeed have a difficulty uh, in establishing where the end is, as McIntyre shows. For instance, did the Roman Republic end with the death of Julius Caesar, or at Philippi, or with the founding of the Principate? McIntyre answers that, in a way, the Roman Republic was a long time a dying, and it is difficult to point to a temporal moment. However, this answer still implies the reality of its ending. The Roman Republic is indeed no longer in place. I think we can all agree with that. Although uh, we might have difficulty in establishing the precise threshold of its decline. The same can be said about an individual life. It is sometimes difficult to assess when a friendship begins. Is it the day we first met that person? Or the day we first organized something together? Let's say going out to theater, or the moment in which we confess to each other our life's secrets. And still, one can certainly see the difference between the part of one's life when this friendship did not exist and the part in which this friendship has developed. The structure beginning, middle, ending is a real structure of the human life and not just the artifice of a literary work. McIntyre has indeed convinced that stories are lived before they are told. To be sure, the structure beginning, middle, and end is not enough to convey the intelligibility of life's narrative. It is quite clear that a succession scheme is not enough to capture life's unfolding. McIntyre gives the example of the travel notes taken by Dr. Johnson during his trip to France. These notes offer indeed a succession scheme, but they still don't offer the whole narrative. So I'm quoting. There we waited on the ladies, dash, Morville's, dash, Spain, period, country towns all beggars, period. At Dijon, he could not find a way to Orléans, dash, crossroads of France very bad, dash, five soldiers, period. End of quotation. One could take these sequences as pre-narrative moments. This is what life looks like before we impose a narrative structure into it. However, these sequences are nothing than the disjointed parts of some possible narrative. It's quite intuitive that Dr. Johnson's trip did not consist only in those flash moments or flash episodes listed in his journal. There is a relation between this sequences, which makes up the unfolding of his trip. This relation is not a post factum interpretation, but rather constitutes the very nature of those actions and events. There, in, there is indeed a passage from one sequence to another, which is real and which makes every sequence possible. How is this relation to be thought? The temporal succession is indeed necessary, but there is also a concatenation of dependencies which explains why the event uh, A rather than B succeeds the event C. 
This concatenation is, according to McIntyre, a causal order of intentions. The configuration of a life narrative depends on the causality of the intentions of the agent. Personal accountability is, for McIntyre, the core of a life narrative because it underpins both the possibility of events and the continuity between events. I quote from McIntyre, thus without the accountability of the self, those trains of events that constitute all but the simplest and barest of narratives could not occur. And without that same accountability, narratives would lack that continuity required to make both them and the actions that constitutes them intelligible. End of quotation. Human behavior must thus be characterized starting from intention. Let's take the case of a man who works in the garden. He might do so in order to exercise or to prepare the garden for the upcoming winter or just to please his wife. It could also be the case that all three intentions are valid but in different degrees. One could do the gardening mainly to preserve the garden but also to exercise and finally to please his wife. In such case, we need to know if only one or two or all are causally effective. Would he, for instance, continue gardening if he would have ceased to believe that gardening is healthy or that gardening pleases his wife? Besides, every intention is embedded in a certain narrative setting. The history of his health, the history of his garden, the history of his marriage. I quote from McIntyre, a setting has a history within which the history of individual agents not only are, but have to be situated, just because without the setting and its changes through time, the history of the individual agent and his changes through time will be unintelligible." End of quotation. Intentions must be ordered also temporally. The short-term intentions can be made intelligible by reference to long-term intentions. Conversely, the long-term intentions cannot be correctly understood if one does not understand the short-term intentions. The uh, relation between long-term and short-term intentions is decisive for understanding uh, narrative history. In sum, in order to understand the life narrative, we need to start from the agent's intentions. Uh, the intentions must be ordered temporally and causally according to the causal efficacy of each of them. Such ordering must take into consideration both the history of the person who acts, but also the history of the settings in which the person acts. The question regards the overall unity of all causal relations. The causal chains, as well as their embedding in a setting, do create a certain order. The problem is whether this order is only sequential or whether it, it encompasses the whole of life from birth to death. One possible response, McIntyre shows, would be to identify, starting from causal relations and their embedding in social settings, certain laws that govern life and thereby make it predictable. A version of this response is Marx's view of human narrative in the 18 Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte. The Marxist conception of life narrative depicts human agency as conditioned by history. Uh, in this conception, may, men make their own history, but they do not make it as they please. They do not make it under self-selected circumstances, but others, under circumstances existing already given and transmitted from the past. This combo between social conditioning and personal agency is governed by laws and makes life predictable. The problem with this response is that it ignores the uh, factual, concrete unpredictability of, um, of our life. 
Shortly put, we never know what will happen next. We might guess it, but the future is always open. How does the causal order cope with this kind of unpredictability that the Marxist model seems to exclude? The response of McIntyre is teleology. Every human life is oriented towards a telos, an end or goal towards which we are moving. Precisely because we do not know what happens next, we project ourselves towards the future. So uh, McIntyre's teleology is very much intertwined with this idea of the, of the open future. We pursue goals even though the horizon on which they are drawn is open and unpredictable. This pursuit, which has goals but does not control the future, constitutes a narrative quest. The unity of this quest is given by one question. What is the good for me? All our goals are subordinated to this core question, which points to a final telos, namely the good. The good enables us to look for particular goods, to exercise our virtues, and understand the integrity and constancy of life. The good that is the final end of the human quest is not searched for in the same way in which miners search for gold. On the contrary, the good can be fully understood only through the quest. A quest, McIntyre says, is always an education both as to the character of that which is sought and in self-knowledge. Thus, the good bestows unity to our life narrative and, at the same time, can only be understood if one connects the dots of particular intentions and particular settings. To wrap up McIntyre's model, the narrative of life is a teleological order of personal agency which unfolds through a diversity of intentions at, and actions that are causally related to each other and that are embedded in a historical and social setting. This model perfectly captures the centrality of personal agency in the account of one's personal life. My life is mainly about me, my dreams, my goals, and my actions. This, of course, begs the question, is a life narrative sufficiently explained by our free will and by the causality of intentions and actions? Is a life narrative only the story of our intentions as stimulated or impeded by the external factors as they might be? Is narrative just a process of character building? I don't think so. Um, McIntyre's model does make room for historical conditioning and social belonging. One could object, though, that their role seems to be contextual and decorative, rather than active and formative in regards to the free will. Even when he assigns them a strong influence, McIntyre describes them as constraints that downgrade my authorship of my life to a co-authorship. We never really leave the story that we please because we are always under certain constraints posed by the social and historical setting. The co-authorship exercised by other people's actions and by other events would need, however, to be fleshed out beyond the generic indication of constraints. I believe that this would not undermine McIntyre's model, but would rather reinforce it simply because the narrative settings need to be explained in their own order and web of relations. Let's move then to the order of causality of history and events. I'd like to discuss here two models, Karamer's model of historical understanding and Noel Carroll's model of narrative connection. In both models, the configuration of narrative settings is described in causal terms. Gadamer focuses especially on history and its effects upon a personal life. Gadamer's idea is pretty simple. Our life is shaped by historical effects, namely by effects caused by our traditions, our history, and our community. <clears throat> 
Of course, tradition does not cause our life in the same way in which a sculpture causes a statue. We are dealing here with a more complex mode of causality. Tradition opens a horizon, which is the range of vision that includes everything that can be seen from a particular vantage point. As such, the horizon is never closed. If it were, we would be trapped in a sort of historical determinism. This is the historicist error that also McIntyre denounced in Marx. It is based on a view of causality, restricted to an efficient causality, conceived as necessary. One cause obtains always the same effect. The concrete belonging to a historical life does not assume this sort of uniform necessity. On the contrary, Gadamer believes that it has the dynamism that it, it is characteristic of life itself. And remember, once again, the definition of life as self-movement. This is a definition that entails a certain spontaneity and dynamism of life. And I'm quoting from Gadamer, uh, the historical movement of human life consists in the fact that it is never absolutely bound to any standpoint and hence can never have a truly closed horizon. The horizon is rather something into which we move and that moves with us. Horizons change for a person who is moving. Thus the horizon of the past, out of which all human life lives and which exists in the form of tradition, is always in motion. The surrounding horizon is not set in motion by historical consciousness, but in it, the motion becomes aware of itself." End of quotation. The agency of history should thus not be seen in deterministic terms as a constraining type of agency, but rather as an agency that sustains and supports our personal agency. How should we understand the causality of tradition within this open horizon and avoid the historic determinism. Looking at Gadamer's model with Aristotelian eyes, it seems to me that his Wirkungsgeschichte, history of effects, is not just about the agency of tradition, which can be expressed through the agency of family, authorities, texts, and art. It is also, and I would say in an even more eminent way, about formal and final causality. Think about your own heritage. It gave your life forms and directions. Of course, we cannot easily discern them from an observing distance because we are already embedded in a certain tradition. For instance, we often do not realize as parents that we sometimes reproduce the same parenting attitudes of our own parents for better or for worse. Gadamer's term for Aristotle's formal and final cause would be, I believe, meaning. Remember, at the beginning of my talk, I showed that one of the significances of meaning in our everyday language is cause. From his perspective, the task of every person who tries to tell the narrative of her life that includes her, her own heritage is to understand the meaning that emerges from tradition. To do so, she should neither imitate nor suppress the agency of tradition. One does not have to find a like-mindedness, a congeniality with the agent of tradition, be it, be it the author of a text, the transmitter of a value or a form. Neither does one have to suppress or deconstruct the agent in order to filter the meaning that his, uh, this agent has somehow hidden. The understanding of our life in light of historical effects requires an interpretation that Gadamer fashions after the model of Aristotle's practical rationality. As in the case of practical rationality, the interpretation of tradition must deal with the relation between universal and particular. One and the same tradition must be understood in a different way by each member of that tradition according to the moving horizon of her life. And uh, formal and final causality, I believe, uh, allow for this sort of um, understanding. Um, 
Similarly, in the moral realm, the person acting must view uh, the concrete situation in light of what is asked of him in general. Of course, understanding my heritage as a part of understanding my life narrative does not necessarily aim at a moral action. But also in the case of this understanding, we deal with the unity of life, which is never given a priori and which can only be discovered in the process of experience. I quote from Gadamer, the relation between means and ends here is not such that one can know the right means in advance, and that is because the right end is not a mere object of knowledge either. There can be no anterior certainty concerning what the good life is directed towards as a whole. Hence, Aristotle's definitions of phronesis have a marked uncertainty since this knowledge is related sometime to the end and some other time to the means. In fact, this means that the end toward which our life as a whole tends and its elaboration in the moral principles of action described in Aristotle's ethics cannot be the object of a knowledge that can be taught. The uh, unity of our life narrative embraces thus the effects that history has upon our life and can only be grasped by understanding our life in a historical horizon. The narrative settings that are intertwined with our personal action need also to be explained in their intrinsic connections. Noel Carroll takes this step. He analyzes the essential ingredient of narrative, namely what he calls the narrative connection in causal terms. Aldo Carroll, who is a philosopher of art, refers mostly to literary works. I think that his model of narrative connection holds also for the life narrative. For every type of discourse to be narrative, it has to possess a narrative connection, namely a specific connection between the elements presented that made it to be a narrative and not another form of discourse such as a chronicle. The proper domain of narrative comprises events and states of affairs for Carol. The first condition for a discourse to be narrative is to refer to at least two, possibly more, events and states of affairs that are connected in a series. An event only would not fit the bill. Thus the statement, there was an old lady who lived in a show, in a shoe, sorry, uh, describes a state of affairs, but is still not a narrative. If we add more states of affairs and events to the statement, it becomes a narrative. There was an old lady who lived in a shoe that was very small, so she went looking for a boot. <laughs> These are Noel Carroll's examples. The second condition of a narrative is to have a unified subject. If there are several subjects, either at least one of them must be unified and consistently present throughout the narrative, or all of them must be connected among each other in such a way that they form together a collective unified subject. Thirdly, a narrative needs a discernible temporal order, which we have seen already in McIntyre. The events and states of affairs represented in the narrative must be perspicu perspicuously time-ordered. That means that the time order must be retrievable, namely the reader must uh, be able to grasp it more or less. One discourse can satisfy the first two conditions but fail this one. For example, the president talked to his advisor. The president ate a piece of cheese. The president jogged. The president waved to reporters. We can tell intuitively that this is not a narrative. Although it makes sense as a description of various events that had the president as their unified object, sorry, subject. Finally, the fourth condition is also the most important one. A narrative needs a causal connection. A simple temporal order is not enough. If we say, I woke up, later I dress, still later I went to class, 
This statement, according to Carroll, does not qualify yet for a narrative. We need a tighter criterion, which should account not only for the domain, the subject, and the stretch of the narrative, but also for a phenomenon which typically takes place in a narrative, namely change. Causation is the best candidate since change implies something, some subtending causal process. A narrative recounts thus a series of events and states of affairs which have a unified subject and are temporally ordered and causally linked, usually through efficient causality. Furthermore, causal events are ordered in a progressive way. If they are not ordered in a forward-looking manner, they compose only an explanation but not a narrative. For instance, the following is an explanation but not a narrative. The battle was lost for want of a horse and the horse was wanting for lack of horseshoe. The narrative would sound like King Philip could find no shoe for his horse and could not ride into battle and as a result, the battle was lost. Carroll sees two types of causality involved in a narrative. A strong deterministic type, which relies on sufficient causes that necessitate their effects, and a weak type, which relies on necessary but not sufficient causes whose effects are not necessary. He believes that the second type, the weak one, is the most frequent. <coughs> Consider the narrative Creon had Antigone executed. Consequently, his son committed suicide, which caused his wife to commit suicide, and as a result, Creon felt anguish. In this example, the earlier events are causes of the later events in such a way that the earlier events supply sufficient grounds for the occurrence of the later event. Carroll believes that this type of strong causality intended in the sufficiency sense is not present in all cases, and especially not in the most typical cases. In most narratives, we have a weaker causation in which earlier events underdetermine later events. This type of causality is consistent with the appearance of a wide range of events and or states of affairs. In this causation type, although the earlier events do not necessitate the later by being their sufficient causes, they are still causally relevant because they make later events causally possible. Take the example, thieves rob the bank. Police are waiting for them outside. When the thieves exit the bank, they are arrested. Robbing the bank in itself does not necessitate an arrest since Alas, there are thieves who are not arrested, but it is still a cause for the arrest. The thieves would not be arrested if they had not robbed the bank. So robbing the bank on this account is a necessary but not sufficient cause for the arrest. The earlier events or states of affairs may also be merely contributions to a causally necessary condition. For instance, many narratives describe states of affairs that do not provide causally necessary conditions for a later event. They nonetheless qualify for a causally necessary condition. For instance, one story might recount that a character was born in Arkansas and that later he became president of the United States. Being born in Arkansas is not a necessary causal condition to his presidency, but a contribution to meet this condition, since the US president must be an American citizen, a condition satisfied by being born in Arkansas. One could object to uh, Carol's account by proposing a connection that is not causal. For instance, Aristarchus hypothesized the heliocentric theory, thereby anticipating the uh, discovery uh, of Copernicus by many centuries. The relation here is one of anticipation, although the first event did not cause the second. Carroll's response is that the lack of any influence between the two events disqualifies this discourse from being a narrative. 
As a matter of fact, in absence of a causal relation, one can speak about coincidence but not about narrative. Narrative would require much more, namely changes in the career of a unified subject where change is a function of causal processes. The narrative connection entails a specific directional comprehension. When we follow a narrative, we anticipate the next events and we have a sense of where the narrative is headed. The anticipation is rarely a prediction since necessity rarely occurs. The earlier events raise certain possibilities, thus offering a broad sense of the narrative direction. Besides, following a narrative also entails integrating earlier events and later events into an intelligible structure. Having this sense of intelligibility means to see how earlier events are conjoined with later events in the narrative. And I quote from Carroll, the criterion of rational acceptability here is whether the subsequent events fall into the range of possibilities opened by earlier events and or states of affairs in the narrative, end of quotation. At this point, we might wonder whether the causality of free will-based intentions and actions and the causality of history and uh, events are enough to account for the causal relations that pervade our lives. Mm. Is there another type of causality at work in our life? I propose a third type, the causality of persons. Mm. <clears throat> we know intuitively that other persons shape the story of our life in a unique way through the specific bond that we carry, friendship, parenthood, brotherhood, romantic love, and so on. They can influence our lives in a way that escapes even the register of direct action. For instance, we are happy when our children are back home from school, even if after they come home, we go back to our writing desk and they do their homework, ideally, of course. <laughs> this is the ideal case. Just knowing that they are at home makes us happy and gives us a sense of peace. The same kind of ecstatic relation can be found also in the case of romantic love, in which lovers strive for nothing else than being with each other. So how do we account for um, the uh, personal relations uh, understood uh, in terms of um, causes? What kind of causes, uh, what kind of causality is at work here um, in an um, experience that uh, seems to go even beyond direct kind of agency? One advocate of a personalist narrative theory is Eleanor Stamp, who defines narrative in terms of a second person experience. Uh, she shows that the usual philosophical knowledge is a knowledge that, namely a propositional knowledge that exhibits properties and categories and is obtained through abstraction and pattern processing. There is, however, also a knowledge of persons which aims at persons and their unique life narrative. Stamp focuses in her analysis of this type of knowledge on the union of love, which she characterizes through personal presence, mutual closeness, and internal integration of the psyche. In Stamp's model, the minimum condition for a personal presence seems to be the direct and unmediated causal contact with and cognitive access to the other person. A relation between two persons entails a sort of agency in which one person influences the life of the other, more or less. However, not every type of personal efficient causality qualifies for a personal relation. Stam gives the following example. If Paula is blind and falls over Jerome, who happens to be unconscious in her path, she may cause him to be moved by falling over him, <clears throat> 
and she may know by touch that it is a human person she has fallen over. Paula thus has a direct and unmediated causal contact with Jerome, but she is not present to Jerome in the strong sense of personal presence. Thus, personal presence requires more than direct efficient causation. And that's where you know, uh, the question is open, what kind of causality do other uh, persons um, have on our life? Personal presence requires a second person experience and shared attention. Second person experience, Stam claims, is a matter of one person's attending to another person and being aware of him as a person when that other person is conscious and functioning, however minimally, she says, as a person. In this example, Paula must be aware of Jerome as a person. Her personal interaction with Jerome must be direct and immediate, and Jerome must be conscious. Furthermore, shared attention uh, of the dyadic sort requires the persons to be aware of each other and in addition, aware also of their mutual awareness, so aware of their own relation. For instance, the object of awareness for Paula is simultaneously Jerome and their relation. Regarding mutual closeness, the relation must start from reciprocally revealing to each other one's own significant thoughts, needs, and desires. Moreover, this exchange is not simply neutral, but involves personal attitudes towards other person's thoughts, needs, and desires. Thus, it also involves needing and desiring the other person. As such, mutual closeness is only possible if each person is internally integrated. A person who is internally divided, who desires something and at the same time hates it, cannot be close to another person. Following Aquinas, Stam believes that this internal integration is realized only in goodness. An evil person is internally disintegrated and has a disordered mind, which is split between having a minimal knowledge of the good and choosing the wrong path. Thus, an evil person can never be close to another person in the strong sense of the term. Stam's account shows that the causality of persons is not limited to the mere agency that occurs through efficient causality. The personal presence and the mutual closeness between persons transfigures one's life, giving it new forms and a new orientation towards good. They exercise, I believe, final and formal causality. Thus, an account of the causality of persons must include several types of causes as they are classified by Aristotle. To illustrate this point, let's analyze the relation between St. Paul and the community of Thessalonians, which is a relation of reciprocal growth in faith. The letters of St. Paul are about the proclamation of the end of the world and the renewal of life in light of this final end. Both the pro proclamation and the renewal of life are enacted by St. Paul himself through his own faith, which resists persecutions and obstacles. At the same time, the Thessalonians, by receiving from St. Paul the proclamation and the call for a renewal of life, become a consolation for St. Paul the relation is not a unidirectional transmission of teaching contents, but rather a spiritual union. And St. Paul says in the first letter to Thessalonians, so desirous of you, we would gladly impart unto you not only the gospel of God, but also our own souls, because you had become most dear unto us. St. Paul comforts the Thessalonians against their tribulations, but finds also solace in them for his own sorrow. Therefore, he says, we were comforted, brethren, in you, in all our necessity and tribulation by your faith, because now we live if you stand in the Lord. 
It is helpful here to bring into discussion Heidegger's interpretation of these letters. Although Heidegger has rejected the concept of causality in many of his writings for reasons that I do not have time to explain. Heidegger notes in Phenomenology of the Religious Life that the Christian dogma can only be understood from out of the enactment of the Christian life experience. The letters of St. Paul are significant in this sense because their doctrinaire content cannot be separated from Paul's concrete experiential situation. This situation is neither a static complex of conditions, for example, Paul's age, the time of the relation, the space, nor a flow of events. The uh, situation must be conceived beyond the distinction static dynamic as a having become that transforms both Paul and the uh, Thessalonians. The life of uh, Thessalonians is transformed by Paul's arrival, but also Paul's faith is transformed and uplifted by their own having become. Paul's uh, having become must be determined as an acceptance of the proclamation, both in great despair and in joy. The despair of a cataclysm that will end the world and the joy of renewal and resurrection. This acceptance triggers an absolute turning around, which is a turning toward God in two directions, serving God and waiting for the end of the world. Both the distress and the joy pertain to the very contents of the proclamation and the end of the world can only be understood in their horizon. The awaiting of the parousia, of the second coming of Christ, is thus an entering into anguish. One cannot even start to grasp a concept such as the end of the world without entering oneself into the anguish of life and eliminate all false security and illusions. The joy is bound up with this anguish, Heidegger shows, but it is not a joy that can be motivated by one's experience. It is a gift, and it's possible only because in his turning around, the Christian enters into a living, effective connection with God. For this reason, the calculation of the when of the parousia is alienating. It deprives those who are waiting from a real life transformation. The authentic waiting for the end of the world is not a mere consciousness of a future event, but an assimilation of this proclamation into the present life. The uncertainty about the when is constitutive for this waiting because it constrains the believers to be awake and sober. Those who believe to know the moment are indulging in the peace and security of this knowledge and are absorbed by what life brings to them, remaining stuck in the worldly. We see thus that the relationship between St. Paul and the Thessalonians causes their lives in the mode of final causality, namely in orienting them towards the parousia, the second coming of Christ, as well as in the mode of formal causality, namely giving their lives a new form, a renewal in anguish and joy. As Heidegger aptly shows, both the proclamation and the new form of life can only be grasped from the enactment of St. Paul in his relation with the Thessalonians. Of course, strictly, strictly speaking, uh, nobody can really enact the second coming um, of Christ in the sense that only Christ himself can come uh, as himself. Uh, Heidegger sometimes is um, very emphatic and uh, spectacular in his language and one can misunderstand very easily uh, what he said, especially regarding the religious experience. But here, certainly he doesn't mean to have this sort of, uh, um, you know, uh, in pathological kind of enactment. Yet there is something about the Christian waiting for the end of the world which provides orientation and anticipation of the life to come in the joy and despair of this life here on earth. From this perspective, the personal relation between St. Paul and the Thessalonians should be understood in terms of formal and final causality, in addition, of course, to efficient causality. And I'm coming to a conclusion. I have shown that the core of the narrative meaning of life is causality. Every time we try to recount our life as a story, 
we resort to causal relations that have impacted our life in various ways, giving it new direction, new forms through the agency of our will, of history of events, uh, of history and events, and of other persons. Causality gives an account of the unfolding of life as well as of life's order in its coherence and in its unity. As we have seen, all types of causality I have discussed entail a certain direction, a teleology, which makes possible the very narrative of life. Several questions still need to be worked out, and they are on my to-do list. Not to mention they are also giving me sleepless nights, as I was telling Father Justin this morning. First, what is the relation between the types of causes I have presented? When we tell the story of our life, which causes come first and which come second? Is there a primacy of causality of intentions, perhaps over the other types of causes? Uh, second, how do causes fare with the question of significance? Do the significance and value of the human life offer a criterion to evaluate and arrange causes, and I think uh, they do. So that's another matter to reflect upon. And third, how do these types of causality, intention, history, events, and persons, fit into the self-movement of life? In which way do they differ from causes that act upon inanimate objects? How is the directionality of life to be understood if life is self-movement? Does this have to do with the rational autonomy of the human person which poses its own ends? Or is it perhaps more than that, as I tried to show? The main task thus remains to account for life, disclosing its character of self-movement in all causal relations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Oliva. So we have about uh, 20 minutes or so for, for questions. And I believe we have a roving mic. Yes. So if uh, you could wait for the mic to reach you, raise your hand, um, wait for it to reach you, uh, and, um, and state your question clearly uh, for not only everyone in the room, but also for the at-home audience. Uh, and I'll hand it right back to you. Sure. So uh, Father Justin, will you take the questions, or should I? Should um, I just... You're welcome to call on the right. software. Sure. You, whichever. Right. Okay, I can call them. Yeah, please, go ahead. <clears throat> uh, perhaps I'll... Thank you. Excuse me. That's quite loud. Thank you for coming. That was a wonderful talk. Um, perhaps I'll start with a very general question uh, such as I'll kind of channel the the street person's philosopher how do we take this and apply it to our lives and change our lives in accordance with bettering ourselves having now heard this talk and uh, so more like a, a practical application mm -hmm. what can we do tonight tomorrow mm -hmm. with this thank you yeah thank you and my thought process has actually started from the, uh, oh, here, yeah, sure. <clears throat> All right, thank you. So my uh, thought process has actually started from the s street uh, type of experience. I just um, asked myself, uh, what do we do when we try to recount our life as a story? And um, I, I realized that when we do that, we uh, resort to a um, certain type of dependency between uh, events, between us and other persons, between um, ourselves and the tradition. So I think there is already in, the, uh, in our everyday life, there, there is already this experience going on. Now, of course, you, you can come back after this sort of philosophical effort and say you have to do more, so you have to reflect even more uh, on these uh, relations of dependence. Um, 
So uh, there is already uh, a naturality about th this sort of narrative kind of account of the human life. And that was the point of my talk, that uh, narrative is not a, a, an artificial form imposed um, uh, upon our life, but it's the very structure of our life. So it's our life itself that is narrative. So, um, if I would have to give a, this sort of self-help kind of advice, would be, would be precisely to, to um, think more deeply to um, all kinds of uh, relations of dependency that run through, um, through your life, about what you have done, what were your goals, what were your dreams, your intentions, um, about the events that happened in your life and how they were related um, among each other, um, and of course about uh, relations with our person. So, so it's just a, a, a level of depth that can be added to an effort that, uh, to a type of um, um, self-awareness that is already uh, in place in every human being when uh, we are trying to think of uh, our life in narrative terms. Yeah, so, so it, it, it's just, you know, pumping up the volume on something that you are already do normally. Uh, just go deeper into that kind of reflection. I, I don't know if it uh, helps as a self-help kind of advice, but yeah. Hello. Hello. Okay, good. Um, I, I wanted to ask, uh, uh, well, I have two questions. Uh, the first is, um, uh, when you say meaning in Gadamer's terms, the formal final cause at work in tradition, mm -hmm. what is an example of formal cause and work mm -hmm. there in that, that formal causality of history and events? The um, parenting attitudes. So the way we um, parent our children, um, is very often replicating the way our parents have raised us. So we, so we received from our parents already certain forms, parenting forms, which we uh, put into practice. It's true that sometimes we realize, oh, I can't believe I'm <laughs> doing the same mistake, um, that uh, I was, you know, uh, uh, critical about when I so was uh, a child or a younger um, adult. Uh, so, in that sense, um, tradition um, uh, acts as a formal cause. So those sort of habits that one gains? Right, yeah. And, mm -hmm. okay, that, that's interesting. I gotta think about it. Uh -huh. All right, well, the, second, uh, the second question is, mm -hmm. how does religion fit in? Because it seems like, mm -hmm. into the narrative uh, here, because it seems like it could fit into all three forms of causality. Mm -hmm. um, in a particular different way. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's the beauty of religion. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd so all three forms of causality um, have this sort of teleological nature. Um, I left it somehow open um, in, in, in my talk, uh, so I, I show that they are all uh, projected uh, into this uh, telos, uh, this final good. Um, obviously, for a Christian or for a religious person, that is God. So that's one way to um, consider religion. Um, another way, I think, has to do with the relation between, we were talking this morning at Father Justin's class, the relation between providence and causality. Namely, how does uh, the divine providence uh, work in my life? And... Um, all these forms of causality can be seen as a, um, a secondary causality that uh, basically um, realizes the divine plan. Now, an interesting question that comes in this regard um, is the question of the special divine action. So how does God act in a special way in each personal life? And um, I think each type of causality 
can offer an opportunity for this sort of special action. Uh, so God can um, act in our lives through persons we encounter. Uh, he can act in our lives through events. Uh, he can act in our lives also by reorienting our intentions, our attention, and so on. So um, besides, you know, the, the general discourse about the relation between providence and secondary causes, there is also this uh, particular question of how God acts uh, in, in a special way in each personal life. So that's another question I didn't um, consider in my talk. Um, I didn't have time to uh, discuss it, but uh, I think that it's, a, it's an important question to consider when considering causality. Yeah. Oh, actually, sorry, there was a question here. <clears throat> Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I'm puzzled, so I obviously, perhaps by the way I'm dressed, although Father Justin's exception, never mind. Um, I ascribe to the more or less Thomistic Aristotelian view of causes, um, mm -hmm. uh, material, formal, agent, and final. And it seems for those four causes that there is some being mm -hmm. um, involved that in which the causes are operative. So what I'm wondering is when we talk about things like events or especially states of affairs, I'm not mm -hmm. sure if you're wanting, states of affairs seems to drop out of your list at the end. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if you're wanting to grant, keep those or to have a being to them. But the question is, I'm just still always puzzled by what being does an event or if we want to be broader, a state of affairs have? Mm -hmm. And in sort of in connection with that, could it be perhaps that states of affairs or, or events, if we want to grant them a kind of being or quasi being, mm -hmm. that what they do is my perception of events, my perception of states of affairs causes me, um, and I'm using the word cause there in a looser sense, causes me to make interpretations and judgments. Mm -hmm. And so that, um, that the, the, tele the, tel the teleology still resides within me Mm -hmm. in the judgment that I make. Mm -hmm. And so I construct a view of the world on st events or states of affairs. Mm -hmm. um, so if we're going to talk about causality, it's only insofar as it influences my judgment and then my judgment then affects where my life goes. Or do, or do events and states of affairs act directly on the narrative of my life regardless of judgment? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So... Uh I guess you are asking whether um, causality is more a subjective type of um, addition rather than an objective feature. So that has to do with the real being of causes. Uh, obviously, my point was to um, show that all these um, causes are real causes. They are not um, subjective projection. Um, There is a way in which tradition, for instance, comes to us in such a strong way that we cannot really um, reject it, or we can can we cannot fantasize upon it. So, in the example I gave with the uh, parenting attitudes uh, that we are reproducing, uh, that's not something that you are projecting subjectively. It's something that really formed you. And that's the idea of the formal causality. So I'm trying to, uh, to show that all these causes, um, uh, th that there is a component of um, um, formative action at work um, um, in this causality. And the formative action means precisely an objective type of action, uh, not a subjective projection, if it makes sense. Yeah? All right, thank you. Uh, yes, please. Thank you very much. That was a very good talk. Um, I just have a general question about um, <coughs> the bringing together some of the, the concepts from Aquinas' philosophy, but also mm -hmm. from the tradition of uh, existential uh, phenomenology. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, many of the many of the concepts, like uh, you know, f uh, formal and final causes, are of course uh, very th very theoretical. Mm -hmm. But I know that uh, one of the tendencies in existential phenomenology, especially with Heidegger and Gadamer, um, especially with 
you know, tradition and heritage and things like this, um, there is a tendency to not want to uh, formulate these in a theoretical, uh, uh, these things like heritage and tradition in a theoretical manner, be because um, this seems to sort of still the life or to try and uh, sort of um, sort of levels down uh, the phenomenon they're trying to get at. So if, if that's the case, uh, what do we, how do we uh, mediate between uh, these two uh, different kinds of analysis? Is, is a narrative a kind of a bridge or? Um yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, that, that was my, my point in the talk, that narrative is indeed the bridge between this um, uh, idea of a spontaneous uh, life, uh, you know, the concrete existence of the human being, which existentialism and phenomenology try to highlight on the one hand, and causality on the other hand. So, uh, and it's also a bit of, a, I would say, a false separation between, uh, you know, the, the nice existential uh, scholarship on the one hand and the Thomistic scholarship which is supposed to be abstract and theoretic. I mean, causality is really, it's real. I mean, we had the question before. It's a real matter and it has to do um, uh, with um, uh, real changes in our life. And uh, all these changes pertain to life's dynamism. So we are really talking about concrete um, existential features. So uh, I tried with narrative to bring together these two um, fields, but I, I really don't believe that th they are so, so strictly separate. Father, I'm sorry. Thank you <coughs> for, for a rich talk. And one of your sources, Noel Carroll, I think, um, uh, comes from the field of aesthetics. Mm -hmm. and. Um, that makes me wonder whether there are not different types of narrative. If you look at literature, for example, that's where it would apply, uh, there are different types depending on uh, the authorial voice, whether there is um, uh, somebody telling the story from God's eyes view or with, um, uh, in a first person or whether it's an implied author, mm -hmm. questions like that. And um, or also second person narratives drama for example i think could be conceived as a second person narrative in toward in that mode um so uh, from your reading or from do you know any kind of typology that people have developed around that that could be useful or any way of making that intelligible further I was trying to um, uh, formulate a sort of um, universal concept of narrative. Uh, so I was not looking into particular types of narrative because um, uh, Noel Carroll is uh, basically showing that uh, the narrative connection um, const is constituted by uh, causality in all forms of narrative. So, um, uh, yeah, I thank you for this suggestion. I, I didn't think about... Um, uh, classifying uh, various forms of narratives. Actually, when you started to um, uh, go into aesthetics, I thought that you would ask me, what about poems? <laughs> so I'm happy you didn't ask that question because I don't have an answer. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's a good suggestion. Thank you. Yes, please. <coughs> Thank you. Um, my question is, um, are you arguing that it's, absolutely, it's, it's actually necessary to have a narrative, to, to have meaning in life? Isn't to exist a kind of meaning? Isn't, isn't just existence, you know, being? Mm -hmm. Isn't that significant? Are you saying that we need, to, in, in order to have meaning and significance, we have to have a narrative? philosophy on the one hand and Thomistic philosophy on the other hand. So, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, did you hear what I said until now or should I repeat? Oh, oh okay. So, um, yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, and I was saying that it ties back into the question on the existential and Thomistic philosophy uh, because you are saying, well, actually, uh, we have this spontaneous existence of the human being. Why do we have to even, you know, bother about meaning? <laughs> 
All right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, the point is that uh, being itself gives itself meaningfully. Uh, to speak in phenomenological terms this time. So uh, meaning emerges uh, through being. So it's not us. I mean, meaning is intentional. Uh, so there is a, an intentional um, component of meaning for sure. But it's uh, an intentionality that is always um, obviously directed to the object. So um, I don't consider meaning as a an addition to being. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Me too. All right. Yes, please. Thank you. Excellent. Um, talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, I was wondering about narrative and specifically there's something about it where you need a narrator and there's something about where you're in a, you have a stance, look, you're looking back, maybe you're looking forward a little bit, you're moving forward a little mm. bit if you're the narrator unless someone's narrating you after you're dead. Mm. Um, but it seems like in narrative you can, in a way, forge a false narrative yourself, a, a kind of delusion, mm -hmm. uh, maybe through no fault of your own, or else mm -hmm. uh, some kind of lie. Mm -hmm. Or other people can have a kind of narrative about you. And so I was wondering what you, if you have any thoughts regarding the truth of a narrative mm -hmm. in that sense, and also regarding the priority of narrative with respect to um, first person type narratives mm -hmm. or um, the narrative of a biographer who would take all of these causalities in, in, in his uh, or her mm -hmm. construction of a, of a narrative, mm -hmm. but would, it would be very different from the one mm -hmm. produced by the person going through it through their own life. Mm -hmm. So uh, to thank you, uh, the first question, I think that uh, what would uh, make the difference between an authentic uh, narrative and a delusional type of narrative is teleology. The fact that the authentic narrative must be integrated into goodness. And, you know, once you have that sort of uh, teleological orientation, I think that self-delusion um, is a very small risk. So I think that in the delusional narrative, the, um, the self, as Eleanor Stam has shown, the self is not integrated into goodness. So there is a sort of disorder there which pushes me into this um, delusional type of narrative. So I, I, would, I would say that teleology would probably be the, you know, the, um, the answer to the first question. Uh, now, the second question, uh, I didn't understand um, very well. So y you are asking what's the difference between the way I recount my narrative and the way somebody else uh, would talk about my life, like a biographer, right? Yeah, um, it can happen uh, that sometimes um, a third-party narrative can um, understand things about my own narrative which I myself didn't understand. So that's possible. And that's actually what happens also in the relation between St. Paul and Thessalonians, that St. Paul understands certain things about the Thessalonians, uh, which perhaps they don't see uh, firsthand. So he, for instance, he, he is telling them, you are uh, elected by God, and there are signs, I show you, there are signs that show that uh, you, you, you are special, you know, you, you became a model of faith and so on. So his, uh, his account of uh, the life of Thessalonians is a second person account. So St. Paul certainly uh, sees some things about the Thessalonians which perhaps they don't see immediately. So I think it is possible that other persons understand certain features better than um, 
ourselves. But uh, yeah, I have to reflect more on this. It's an interesting question. Thank you. Hello, and uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, looking at the, the notes here and listening to the talk, one thing that occurred to me is that uh, rather than a beginning, middle, ending, it seems as if what would track more clearly to salvation and uh, the eschatological dimension of man is that it's more of an origin, a past, and a, an eternal present mm -hmm. where uh, you're at the, at the beginning, you're damnable, at, they're in the middle, you make a hash of it, but that's only in your past, and the internal now is, are you damned or are you saved? Mm -hmm. And that, that end, the actual end, uh, which determines forever, could happen at any moment. Mm -hmm. uh, however, I don't know how well that tracks with some of the other points here. I don't know if you could, maybe that's outside the scope of the talk, mm -hmm. but how would that track to some of the other thinkers on the, uh, you've talked about in this presentation? So you, you are asking about um, the afterlife in relation to the structure, beginning, middle, and ending? Uh, yes, whether there's a, a true end or just an eternal present. And in, mm. in a, from a first-person perspective rather than a second-person pers mm. perspective or these other perspectives, mm -hmm. how well some of these other ideas would latch on to that. Because mm -hmm. if there's going to be the... the uh, theological and philosophical bent of the whole project, they would have to tie together quite nicely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so what other insights would be added on to this from the other thinkers? Yeah, thank you. Uh, obviously the structure, beginning, middle and end, is a natural structure. So, um, of course in the um, the relation between St. Paul and Thessalonians, there is a glimpse into the afterlife, into the end of the world and the life to come after you know, the end of the world. So um, certainly the afterlife um, needs to be uh, considered if one wants to see um, the human life beyond death. So if one is asking about the uh, phenomenon of death, obviously the afterlife um, is important. Now, the whole teleological direction I was mentioning, um, again, can be the um, um, a way to look um, for afterlife. So that um, one could indeed ask for every type of causality, the causality of uh, intentions, uh, the causality of history, uh, the causality of persons. One can ask, how is that final end to be considered in regards to death? So for instance, in the case of history, um, uh, one can ask, um, is there a, an idea of salvation that um, underpins the human history as such, not only the personal life of a human individual, but the whole history of mankind? So um, that's how I would look at the afterlife. But yeah, I, I, didn't, um, I didn't talk ab about it um, um, in my paper because I was really looking at the um, causality um, that... Um, act in our life in the natural um, order. Thank you. <laughs>